Yes, so, so uh, I've, I've been given the uh, dubious honor of, of being the first speaker, right? Uh, so uh, now one thing you want to, so we're here to discuss uh, sort of theoretical physics and machine learning, right? And so theoretical physics is a pretty old subject and machine learning is a pretty new subject. So I'm representing the old part, right? <laughs> Because very unusually, we're going to see that many of the speakers are, are quite a bit younger than me, let's say, right? Um, much younger and more diverse than you normally see at a theoretical physics meeting. Now, yeah, now I have, I do, do, do not worry, right? I only have 120 pages of slides, <laughs> and there's no more than three equations per slide. Uh, uh, and there is, there will be a pop quiz, by the way, at the end. Uh, uh, you do that to your students. See how how you how much how you much you enjoy it. Okay, so here we are at this KITP, right? So this is the Institute for Theoretical Physics, and to represent that, right? Um, nothing happens. So much for yeah, machines. Uh, let's see. Now even less happens. Uh, magic. That's back. And now the screen is gone. Something. So this one guy is loose, but it. Sure. Yeah, see, that's what, there we are. But it's still not progressing. Okay, not not to worry, there's buttons. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the, there, the power was on. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those little tricks, right? You've got to turn the power on in order to. <laughs> uh, okay. So here's a picture of theoretical physics, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is what theoretical physicists do, and you can even see on this blackboard here, right? Uh, this was from yesterday's talks, I think. And when we go outside for the uh, coffee breaks and things like that, you'll see that this is a beautiful building, uh, and this is the world's premier institute for theoretical physics. This was this was created about 40 years ago or so, and it's been mimicked all over the world now, but this is still, I would say, the number one spot uh, for theoretical physics. And uh, it's been led by a very distinguished line of uh, theoretical physicists, of which Lars is the most recent. And just this year, Lars was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, which is a very high honor, and he's... <laughs> He's a very quiet guy, but he's a very distinguished quiet guy, right? <laughs> uh, unlike me. Uh, so, so this is what we think of when we do theoretical physics. Uh, yeah, now it's working. Now, for also for the last roughly 50 or 60 years, we've had a subject called computational physics. So around the time of the Manhattan Project and so forth, people began to realize that just driving the equations of physics was uh, still important, but you also needed to solve them, and you needed to solve them sufficiently accurately for the problem at hand. And they started using computers, and in particular, uh, Nick Metropolis and Feynman and Teller at Los Alamos used that when they were developing uh, the nuclear weapons. Uh, and so here's a picture I picked at random from plasma physics. And you know the details don't matter, but what it is is you use the latest computers that are available. And, and at certain times in the past, it has been physics applications and other science applications that have driven the development of our modern computers. And things like the internet began as DARPANET and things like that. Uh, OK. So then we also have quantum mechanics, right? And this starts uh, about 1900. Uh, Max Planck first introduces something called Planck's constant, and it's the first sign that there's something seriously wrong with classical physics. So for classical physics here, we'll think of Newton 
and Newton's laws. Uh, how many people have tried at least to teach Newton to their students? <laughs> Raise your hand high because I can get a good sense of it. Okay, good. Uh, so, but you know, all that sort of comes apart, uh, and we and so so these nice illustrations, right? Well, what you can see clearly here from the 20s and 30s that hairstyle was a bit of an issue, right? Uh, well, we have famous people like, and especially Schrodinger, right? The Schrodinger equation is the equation which, if you solve it, tells you the rules of quantum mechanics for many, many systems. Uh, so, yeah, this is a nice book that you can get uh, for about 10 bucks, but it's fun to, you know, it's a sort of graphic novel of the start of quantum mechanics. Uh, and then we discover that, uh, so, so actually, if you, if, if you go to a sort of regular physics, I mean, if you look at the 20th century, there were many uh, advances in, in theoretical physics in the 20th century, but I would claim that the most useful one was quantum mechanics by far. So there's lots of extremely intellectually uh, fascinating improvements in all sorts of things, especially astrophysics uh, and cosmology and so forth. Uh, but the most useful one was quantum mechanics. And as I'm going to explain, the reason that quantum mechanics was so useful is because it allowed you to understand chemistry and materials. So as a practical matter, this has had an enormous impact. And it was only that he happened to be around, Linus Pauling was around at the start of quantum mechanics and then he wrote these very famous papers that became the theory of the chemical bond. And all of our sort of knowledge and understanding of chemistry is basically in the language that uh, Linus Pauling used in 1933. Okay, so very famously though, uh, one of the founders of quantum mechanics was a very strange person called Paul Dirac. He was a physicist at Bristol and there's a great book about him uh, from a few years ago uh, by a guy called Farmello. And he, so he was an unusual sort of person. And he said in 1929, and Einstein credited him with uh, sort of this, one of the deepest understandings of quantum mechanics. And he says um, that the, all the physical laws necessary uh, for the mathematical theory of a lot of physics, sort of everyday physics and all of chemistry are completely known and the only difficulty that is that the equations are a little too hard to solve. So about 25 years ago or so, I started getting interested in this problem of how do you sort of solve the equations of chemistry uh, on a computer uh, in order to make predictions, right? How do you solve the Schrodinger equation? And about that time, people would quote this. Uh, in this field, and, they, and this, to me, it always looked like, well, this is some sort of very fancy theoretical physicist saying, well, we figured everything out important, and the rest of you out there just, uh, you know, try to figure out how to solve those equations, but we don't care. So this is what people would say in this field, right? However, if you go and you read the original paper, uh, you discover that the next sentence is, uh, that in fact the meaning of this is totally the opposite. He's saying because it's too hard to solve, then we need to work on this problem to make simple approximations so that we have things that we can solve. And this is what he wanted to do. And in fact, he worked on this uh, quite a lot. Uh, okay. So okay, so that's that's physics, right? Uh, and we'll get back to that story shortly. Uh, now let's go to machine learning. So machine learning, so you're going to hear a lot about machine learning today, I guarantee it, right? And I, I'm not an expert in machine learning, right? I don't know much about it. Uh, but the people who follow me are experts because they're younger, right? Uh, <laughs> it only appeared about 10 years ago, I would say. The, the, let's say the, the, uh, a lot of the most recent things came in the last 10 years. Of course, there was lots of stuff in the past. So examples include Google's PageRank, right? So you're all, you, we all actually now use machine learning all the time without even knowing about it. And one of the most famous ones, the thing that got, somebody, somebody may remember back, you know, there used to be like Yahoo and other, there were other sort of search engines, right? 
only vaguely remembered, right? Uh, what happened to them? Well, Google happened to them, right? So this was a computer scientist, and they developed this thing called PageRank, where they looked at they looked on the web and they look at how many pages, uh, given pages, connected to, and they use these connections to decide what it, you know uh, what's the most important way to answer your question. What are the most important websites? And this page rank was so uh, successful, and it basically sort of solved this problem of when you type in, uh, how do you find throughout the entire web the most relevant pages? Uh, it basically made Google, right? It, it, that's that's how Google uh, sort of first became really noticed, and then it has, of course, branched all over the place. How many people know the story about AlphaGo? Okay, so I'll tell you about AlphaGo, right? So, so I know some of these things because I work sometimes with the people from Google. Uh, so, whatever it was, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a famous match of was it deep blue in the playing chess with the world chess champion who was the russian at the time kasparov yes exactly and and it didn't go so well for kasparov uh but for up to that time there'd been this problem of, of a sort of a, making a computer that could beat the world chess champion right and that sort of problem is one where the rules are well known and you could load up the computer with lots and lots of old games by old masters, and the computer would calculate using the rules from you know what the likely positions are, and would run through you know millions, if not billions, of possible moves and evaluate them and decide what to do. And this computer was ultimately able to to beat Kasparov. But the game of Go is a much harder game, a much more sort of open game. And so it was always thought that you couldn't really design a computer to win a game of Go, and it depends on lots of sort of human judgment, and uh, the, the number of combinations is far, far greater. Well, so with machine learning, uh, they created this, this, this thing called AlphaGo, uh, which, uh, well, the, the first thing that they did was they, so they trained uh, looking at all the old games, but the difference was instead of trying to sort of figure out all possible moves in the future, it uses these machine learning algorithms where it sort of teaches itself what it would like. Uh, it, it sort of figures out, just it just learns from old games, not just not trying to compute all the possibilities, but simply come up with the most, the sort of the best possible answers, but not going through all all options. And you'll hear about some of these algorithms uh, later. But AlphaGo was then able to beat, uh, I think it was the number three ranked uh, Go champion in the world. Uh, and then a later version of this, this program uh, beat the world's champion. Now, since then, uh, they've created further machine learning algorithms where they now have basically something like two of these machines. And instead of starting them off with a list of all the human games that have ever been played, uh, instead, they have these two machines play against each other. You only tell them what the basic rules are and no other information. And they learn from the outcome of these games uh, what is the best strategy. And so armed with, um, with, with these games that no human has ever played and playing in a totally different style, now the latest version of this can beat the one that beat the number one human a hundred times in a row. So it is now at a point where this, this game... And actually we heard, I think it came out just in the last few weeks, of something called Alpha Star. Does anybody know what the game Stargate is? Raise your hand if you know what Stargate is. Ah, some people know what Stargate is, right? So now there's a thing that just came out in the last few weeks called Alpha Star. So Stargate is a very, very complex game with many moving parts, and you need a, a, a variety of strategies to win this game. And Alpha Star, I think it was unveiled this month anyway, uh, is a neural network which uh, can win against, I think, for, uh, we heard it was against any human. 
playing this game. So these, so what's happening in this world of games is the games are getting much more complicated and the machine learning is able to actually uh, do the things that humans used to be champions at, right? Uh, and we'll, he we'll hear lots of examples of this. Okay. Oh, this is one. Uh, so so this, is a, this is theoretical physics, right? But I'm afraid I've included a little biology. Uh, so this is just one I happen to know about from a friend at Google. Uh, so people take uh, pictures of the back of your eyeball, and if you have diabetes, uh, they, they look at the, the, the blood vessels in the back of the eyeball, and you can spot when hemorrhages occur, and this is the sort of process by which diabetes can lead to blindness, right? And something like 400 million people in the world uh, uh, have gotten uh, blindness through this, this uh, process. So Google is very interested in going into health, and uh, so, so in, the, in this thing that came out about a year or so ago, they were showing that, so in me, lots of medical applications, the question is like, how do you decide when something is diseased and something is healthy? And in the past, of course, it's always been sort of very highly trained doctors, and, and it could be this, it could be, you know, is there a tumor in a, in a cancer scan or anything like that? And it's a person who says, is it this or is it that, right? Now, in, in virtually all cases where they've trained these algorithms, the algorithms outperform now the humans. And it is a much more sort of reliable thing to give it to the, uh, the computer that looks at these images and decides which ones. Now, you'll probably also see during the day lots of things where people figure out whether or not it's a cat in an image, right, which is also fun, but this is kind of more important. But the reason I bring this one up is because uh, I'm talking to the guys involved with it, right, when they were showing this to the doctors after, so they, so they get a whole bunch of data, right? They get these scans and they know whether or not the person was healthy or sick. And so they, they use this data and then they use that to train the machine. It's called supervised learning. You have the data, it finds the pattern. Well, uh, in this case, of course, when they had done the study and then they're showing it to the doctors, the doctors aren't exactly enjoying the presentation that much because you don't like to find out that this computer can do your job better than you. But in the process, my friend was telling me that they were uh, uh, showing them this and uh, a kid in the back of the room, a high school kid, uh, says, oh, and by the way, you know, I don't know, it wasn't this picture, right? That's the picture uh, that's uh, from a woman. Uh, and, and they say, what? Like, he said, oh, that's from a woman. Uh, and, and they say, well, how do you know? And the kid was a summer intern, right? And the kid's job was to feed the, you know, type up the data and feed it into the computer. And the kid noticed that on the files, it also said whether or not the patient was male or female. So that's yes or no. So he fed that piece of data in as well as everything else and then discovered that the computer can look at the image of the eyeball and tell like almost perfectly whether or not it's a man or a woman. And nobody knew that, that the, the, these, these eyeball scans give you that information. Nobody had ever thought to ask that question before. And I was a high school intern, figured that out. Um, okay, okay, so back to work, right? <laughs> that was our uh, fun bit. Now back to the physics-y things, right? <laughs> Molecular dynamics. So there's a huge field called molecular dynamics of modern, and it's not just physics, but it's chemistry and materials and lots of other things, right? And so, so when you have something like a molecule, and I brought along the simplest possible molecule. Now, this isn't a real molecule. This is a representation. <laughs> right? But this is... So, so, the, so these, these are two hydrogen... How many people here teach, have, teach or have taught chemistry as well as physics? Okay, great. Fantastic. Okay. Now I'm in my element, right? So, uh, so this is H2, right? Yeah, so you know what that is. That's great. Okay, so, uh, so 
the nuclei, by nuclei we just mean the centers, right, are, are much heavier than the electrons, okay? So, we, so things that are light uh, tend to be more quantum mechanical. Uh, but the nuclei are heavy and most of the time you can treat them as classical point particles and they follow Newton's laws. Now, way back in the 30s, people started developing a sort of approximate rules for the forces between atoms in a molecule. And if you have a formula for the force between the atoms, then you can feed it to the computer and it can just solve Newton's equations for the forces between the atoms. Uh, and you can do what's called a molecular dynamics simulation. And that's just using the positions of the atoms, but not the electrons, because you can't do quantum mechanics uh, that way. But you can now, nowadays do a huge simulation. Uh, uh, so, so there are lots of these simulations for drug design and materials discovery use these what we call classical simulations. Uh, but they cannot break bonds because when you break the bonds, the electrons determine the energetics and you need quantum mechanics to figure that out. Uh, so here's a picture from, I think, Klaus Schulden's group. Uh, but this is the kind of thing where you get a big chunk of uh, protein or something and you're looking at some you know, real biological process. You can do that uh, and there's a whole industry of this where people in universities and companies and everywhere do this for medicinal chemistry and drug design. and things. So, so this is going on all the time. Uh, you buy the software uh, and, and you run it. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a Nobel Prize a few years ago in chemistry for uh, sort of mixing quantum mechanics with this kind of thing. But the problem is you cannot break bonds. So if actual chemistry occurs, these simulations don't work, right? Which is a bit weird, right? But a lot of biophysical processes, or, or you know, you, you sort of stop the movie, do the chemistry, and start the movie again. But it's, it's, it's not good, right? Uh, OK. And all you really want out of these, uh, the uh, quantum calculation is the energy as a function of the separation of, of, say, two nuclei. Now, this is the simplest bond, right? I'll show you fancier ones in a while. But if you can calculate that, so this is the energy for two electrons in a, hydrogen, uh, in a hydrogen molecule as a function of the distance. Uh, and, and the place where the minimum on the energy is, that's where the force is zero, and that tells you the equilibrium bond length. So if you can figure that out, you can predict what the equilibrium bond length of a molecule is. Now, People won't be that impressed because they've known the equilibrium bond length of H2 for about 100 years or so, right? But if you can do it for a bigger molecule, one that nobody's ever really looked at before, then they're impressed. Uh, okay, so this is a slide I made, you can tell, sometime you know, back in the 18th century, uh, where we still had slides and, and you drew things and pictures, but I uh, scanned it. Uh, and so these are all these different materials and they only differ uh, in many areas of science, they only differ by having different nuclei and different numbers of electrons, but nothing else, right? Uh, so why is this, why is this, so, 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 so we know the laws of quantum mechanics, we know that if we solve them, it will make these predictions, right? But why is it that we can't, right? And so there's an, e this is, we call it an evil problem, right? So you have to do quantum mechanics uh, because it's what we call a many-body problem, right? Every electron sees every other one as well as the nucleus. It turns out the energy of these electrons is actually really, really large. Each atom has a huge amount of electronic energy and it changes just a tiny amount when you f make a chemical bond, as in like one part in 10 million or so, right? So this is, this is problematic because the accuracy of your calculation has to be really high. And then the, mo the worst part is if you really solve the Schrodinger equation accurately, when you double the size of the system, the computer cost increases by 128, two to the seventh. So it doesn't matter if you have 
NASA's latest and greatest supercomputer, right? You'll have some size molecule that you can do and people will be impressed. And then they'll say, oh, but can we do this one? And it's twice as big, right? And suddenly you need a computer that's more than 100 times bigger. So we've had this Moore's law running for you know, 40 years where the power of the computer goes up by a factor of two every 18 months or so, right? But even then, right, you have to wait a decade or so in order to do this kind of thing. So you always run out. And it turns out if you really want to solve the Schrodinger equation for a molecule, I will. No, okay. Uh, I thought I was going to ask. Uh, I'm only warming up here. About the word cost. Do you mean memory or uh, money cost, or do you mean chips? Uh, in in this in this case, well, you can actually do various trade-offs, right? But it's basically the uh, the speed, right? So uh, the, the it will ta it will take 128 times longer, right? But given a certain piece of hardware, uh, this is, uh, well, I, yes, it'll take 128 times longer, and you will need a, a bigger machine as well, right? Uh, okay, let's skip that. Okay, this is the great, now, of course, you're actually going to get the greatest free lunch ever. Uh, at lunchtime, right, it will be provided by the KITP staff. But if you want to solve these kind of problems, right, there were, there was a bit of technology was created uh, in the 60s by Holmberg and Cohn and then Cohn and Sham. And I don't know if you've noticed, right, the place, the building where we are is called Cone Hall. It's the same cone, right? Uh, now, if, if he had only patented this, right, we could have been in a much nicer building, <laughs> right? <laughs> But he was actually an ex so so you should Google him. He's a very interesting guy, and he passed away uh, two or three years ago. Uh, and he was a great theoretical physicist, one of the great theoretical physicists of the 20th century, and also a great sort of humanitarian. And his story is very very interesting. But one of the things he did was he came up with this scheme where you know, he said, given the, these problems, uh, is there a way around them? And he made up a, a way around them that is very odd. Uh, and I'm not, I, I guess I'm going to skip some of the details. Uh, oh, yes. So in order to illustrate this idea, I'm going to use these. How many people know what this? Oh, fantastic, right? Uh, OK. So, so I'm going to try to explain the idea right, uh, using one of them. So part of what I wanted to do, where's my Java? So this is, the, I've been using these in my classes for at least 10 years or so. So I still have one of the old Java applets, right? That's not HTML. So if the web goes down, it still works, right? Uh, okay, so here we go. This is, so, so this is the power of simulation, right? Uh, you know, it's great how you can really sort of bore your students with uh, good simulation. <laughs> Okay, so this is sort of boring. This is the Earth going around the sun, right? Uh, so now I'm going to add the moon, right? And so, so there, there it goes, and the moon is going around the Earth there. So the great thing about these simulations is you can speed them up or slow them down. I can put a grid on, right? And that's nice because, you know, well, yeah, so many people use them, right? I mean, you can uh, even give them quantitative problems once there's some way to measure things. Uh, and in, per uh, in particular, uh, in this case, we want to see the path, right? So we all learn, right, that the, uh, you know, you can think of the Earth as going around the sun and the moon going around the Earth, right? But until you see that kind of picture, right, you wouldn't really realize that means that the path of the moon there is, is a little... So, right, it's just doing little circles around the Earth, but because the Earth is also moving, uh, so I want to pause this, right? Now, now this is, a, this is a classical problem, right? And it's just gravity, but so the, the different particles are interacting. This is the Sun, uh, the Earth, and the Moon. And this is a very simple one, right? The Moon really is just going around the Earth, and the Earth is just going around the Sun. But see that even then it makes that very... 
uh, quite an interesting pattern in pink. Uh, so, what Walter did was imagine the following. So, so this is a simple three-body problem, but imagine you're dealing with something like Jupiter, and you have, I've forgotten how many moons Jupiter has. Hmm? Lots, yes, thank you. A very scientific term. Lots of moons, right? And imagine they're all the same size, right? Then you wouldn't, you, you really need a very complicated computer uh, simulation to figure out what's going on. You, it is, you can't separate it into a two-body problem, right? But, so if you just stare at this picture, and of course I, I wasn't able to remove the, 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 this, this line, but just stare at the pink line there, right? You could imagine that the Earth not being there at all, and you wiggle the gravity of the sun just a little bit. You make a change in time. But you could find a force from, for, you could make up a fictitious force for the sun that would make the moon do exactly that pattern, right? If you knew that force, you wouldn't have to solve for the Earth's motion, right? If, now, this, this makes no sense, because <laughs> to figure out that force, you obviously figure out that the Earth, right, where it is, and the Earth is, right, and then, then that's simple. It's obvious, it seems much more complicated to think of this imaginary force just on the moon alone, right? That's because it, this seems nuts because it's a classical problem. In quantum mechanics, right, the particles are smeared out into these probabilities of finding them. They're not at any one point with a definite velocity uh, at any time. And if we, we can eliminate something like the Earth, or maybe there were many Earths and it's going in a crazy pattern, by a sort of average over the Earths, and you'll get an approximate uh, pink line. But by doing this, you've switched it logically from this many body problem to just one thing interacting with one other thing. And so the complexity of the equations that you have to solve are much, much simpler. And this is what, now, now this is like a totally weird thing to do. Uh, but they did this in 65, they imagined this. And it turns out then the, the last step is they then say, okay, well, here's an approximation. Try this approximation, and it works pretty good. How's my timing? I think I'm in desperate trouble. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so let's see what happens. Back here. So they do this. And this is a very obscure, it's not that obscure. Uh, uh, there we go. Yeah, we're back. Okay. So they do this, except I've lost the uh, clicker. Maybe it'll work now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not taking any question. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, no. Can you hear me? Am I on the No. Better. There. Much better. Yes. All right. Uh, in that model, so we have yeah. the, the pattern of the moon. You're saying wiggle the wiggle the sun, and you can get that that object. Right. Are you looking at it in two dimensions because the moon actually goes in a helix yeah, in its orbit? So when you're solving, are you solving for a flat? Or are you actually solving in three dimensions? So in that simulation, it's flat, okay. uh, right? So those simulations, I don't know if you've checked some of them out, right? They tend to simplify Craziness things a occurs. little bit. Yeah, yeah, but good enough for for teaching purposes, yes. But yes, uh, okay. So it turns out when you do this trick, right, you don't know that force, right, from that you would have to wiggle, so you make an approximation. But once you do that, then, uh, it turns out it's good enough for solid state physics, but not accurate enough for chemistry. Uh, 
And then in the 90s, people made more accurate uh, approximations, and this thing became very popular in chemistry and materials. Uh, so I want to get back to the machine learning part, right? So modern research to find this little piece of energy, right? Uh, I sometimes uh, compare it to this because this. So this. Uh, so I said quantum mechanics was evil, right? But my my sort of dear old friend Walter Cohn was also evil, because he proves. I mean, this is a real physics trick, right? He proves that this thing exists, but doesn't tell you anything about it, right? Uh, so. So we work on these formulas and try to get them more accurate. And the more accurate they are, the better the simulations are, right? So it's really important. But the biggest, the most important thing is you can solve the equations of quantum mechanics much, much more uh, cheaply. And yes, yeah, so I, I guess somebody was mentioning, right? This turned out. So there are various ways of measuring this, right? But one thing is uh, NVIDIA estimated that one sixth of the world's supercomputers are devoted to solving electronic structure problems, one-sixth. Uh, it, it is huge, right? Uh, there are ver very few scientific fields whose output is, me is measured in thousands of papers per year, right? I used to make a joke that, uh, you know, I could look up some of these papers, and there was one in the European Journal of Soil Science. And it's like, so you can do these calculations on dirt, and get them published, right? Uh, <laughs> but somebody pointed out to me that this joke has come back to haunt me because now I have a, a very brilliant postdoctoral fellow working with me who, uh, who's trained in the Department of Geology. So now even in geology, they hire people to do these simulations. Uh, but I've gotten way off track. I know I've gotten way off track. So, so the applications, uh, there are many. Uh, from catalysts to the materials genome project you may have heard of. Uh, people are doing all these DFT calculations. The world's hottest supercomputer, uh, superconductor was predicted by these calculations and then made and found to have these properties. Uh, so this is, this is a huge business. And the fact that your, your MacBook Air doesn't has lead-free chips in it is because of these sort of calculations. So here's Walter, right? Yes, he passed away in 2016. And see, he's grinning, right? Because he set this whole game in motion. He was also grinning because uh, in 1998, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Now, you know, pfft, there's lots of theoretical physicists who won Nobel Prizes in physics, but it takes a real genius to one, win it in a subject you know almost nothing about. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, yeah. There are, I think, there are only four cases of physicists winning Nobel prizes in chemistry, and and the sort of the top ranked one is is Marie Curie, right? Uh, uh, Rutherford, uh, and, she, and she, of course she won them in both subjects. The only person. Okay, two problems in paradise. Problem number one is by using these fake electrons, so, they, so even though you've done this replacement, you still have to solve the equations. Uh, it still takes too long, and you can't, can't run it like you would run a regular molecular dynamic simulation. And then the other thing is that the most interesting exotic phenomena in quantum uh, stuff, uh, these sort of methods tend to fail. And in fact, that's how we first came to, I first came to be working with Miles. We are very interested in what are called strongly correlated systems. So I'll give you one example. We'll go back to our H2, right? If I try to use my standard DFT calculations on H2, and I see, I can tell how much energy it takes to break the bond. Uh, but I'm going to take the two hydrogens. And, and I'm going to sort of treat them, I'm going to isolate them as much as I can, and I'm going to separate them, and I'm going to take one to Mars, let's say, right? Now, you can prove that the two electrons that were in, uh, in this uh, combination are in what we call a spin singlet. Electrons have spin, and one of them is spin up, and one is spin down. But you don't know which one is which. And in fact, you can show that on each hydrogen atom, 
there is a 50% chance of a spin up and a 50% chance of a spin down. So you take that one to Mars and I look at this one and I measure the spin of the electron on this hydrogen atom and either it's up or it's down. But the instant that I discover which one it is, I immediately know which one it is on Mars, that it's the other one on Mars. So this is, a, this is one of the paradigm examples of, we now call this quantum entanglement. People have managed to do this with photons, not with electrons, over hundreds of miles these days. This was part of the reason why Einstein really didn't like quantum mechanics. This, they call it spooky, uh, what do they call it? Spooky action, and thank you very much, right? How can that information have gotten from one side to the other instantly, but you can show that it doesn't really violate things. But this kind of calculation, you do a modern DFT calculation for this process, and it fails miserably because the quantum effects have gotten too strong. And it turns out it's really, really annoying. So I don't tell you this in the advertising. So in chemistry, and here's, here's some more, more real chemistry, right? For most chemical systems, these quantum effects are not important. But when you get to arrangements of solids that have this great symmetry, because they're big lattices of things, they become much more important. And it turns out really annoyingly that a lot of the applications that the Department of Energy cares about, mostly in uh, solar, uh, sort of photovoltaics, all sorts of things, oxide materials are a little more strongly correlated than these are. And so these DFT methods sort of fail. So it would be really good if we could fix that, right? Which we will do, but possibly not before lunch. Uh, uh, Okay, so one thing is in, in this machine learning revolution, right, we have big data in materials. Uh, so this is the materials genome project. So everywhere around the world, people are generating massive databases of these DFT calculations because you want to d design new materials, right, with certain functionalities. We're at this point where w we can make all sorts of new materials but our intuition fails, old guy's intuition sort of fails because you can make so many different combinations. So you make a huge database and you use machine learning to try to find a material that has the properties that you want. Uh, and people are beginning to succeed at that. Uh, so how is my time? Here's kernel ridge regression. Uh, 10, minutes or so. 10 minutes total or? The, the talk and then this. And Okay, oh great, okay, so we're, we're good, okay. So kernel ridge regression, so you're gonna hear throughout the rest of the day very fancy machine learning things, right? I'm gonna show you some really simple machine learning things because they're the only things I know, right? Because uh, uh, I'm over the age of 40, did I mention that? Uh, okay, so kernel ridge regression, so uh, I ran into this guy, a computer scientist, uh, TU Berlin, a really, Nice guy, uh, five or six or seven years ago at a math institute, and he's a guru of this kind of machine learning. Uh, and so, so then we asked the question, could we use it to improve our density functionals? So, so you have some function, and you write, you want, so I'll, 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 it's better to show you. So, so this is, looks so different from your sort of grandpa's theoretical physics, right? Uh, so you have so here's a function of x, right? How many people also teach math? Right. Uh, so so there's the other part of math, right, is statistics, right? So usually you either like the physics-y part of math or you like the statistics, but you don't necessarily like both, right? Uh, so this is all statistics. So I have some function here, I don't know what it is, and there's and I have data. I've measured this function. But the data has noise, right? So it bounces around a bit. And this is all I have, right? Uh, now, uh, so if I use this, 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 so what we do is we approximate the function by a sum of Gaussians, and the Gaussians uh, are, have some distance in them. Uh, so, so the more data I have, the more Gaussians I include. 
and how, how wide these Gaussians are is determined by one parameter, and then a second one we call the noise level determines how smooth my fit is to the, to the data. If the noise level is very high, then it forces this function to be very smooth. And all I do then is minimize the error uh, with the noise included. So when I do that here, and I give it a high noise level, it produces a function that's very smooth, all right, but it doesn't, go, it doesn't model the, the underlying function very well. If I decrease the noise level, uh, I get a reasonable looking fit. And if I decrease it too much, the thing uh, fits all the data, and that's what we call overfitting, right? And we know that the, you know, what you're doing is just fitting a particular data, and then if I give you a new data point, it'll be pretty bad, uh, because it's just fitting that noise. So then we have these tricks like cross-validation. You take, so you have 100 data points, you remove 20 from your data set, uh, which you're going to go back to to test, and then you, you, you train your thing, and then you minimize your error on the remaining 20, so that's uh, leaving out 20, and then you do it again and again, and you get the best fit of these parameters, and you average them, so this is like a trick, a bootstrap trick, to try to get the best parameters, and when you do that, uh, it turns out the best value is 0.46, uh, and so there's your fit, at 0.46, and there's the original function. And you see it, it, it does this balancing act between fitting the function and over, not overfitting, not underfitting. So it figures out how to do that. Uh, so we apply this to try to find functionals. Could I ask a question? Yes. Uh, it, it might be a very naive question, but um, so when we just make measurements, um, how do we know that the measurements are even noisy. You, so, yes. I, I don't know if I... Um, so you, you've, made a, you've made a set of measurements, and why do we know that those measurements have noise? Uh, so, so, so this... Okay, so this is like some of the, like, really difficult... This is like one of these very difficult questions in this field, right? So... If you're a physicist, right, and you sort of look at this thing, right, you have what, the, what we call prior knowledge. You, you have a sense of what the problem is that you're solving. I mean, you sort of look at this and you see, right, oh, this is the noisy stuff and there's some underlying signal, right? But if you're looking at, you know, people's choices for the Netflix movie, right, then those rules don't apply. So how you figure out which is the, is a very hard question, yeah. So we, we are assuming some framework to start with. So I mentioned very quickly, right, this, so, so the rise of this field has come about, it, it's this Bayesian point of view, right, where you have some sort of unknown distribution behind the data, and you make assumptions about what it looks like. You have to make some assumptions. Now, the reason this has taken off, in my opinion, over the last 10 years or so, is our, uh, the, just the vast computational power we now have. So Bayesian type theories you can actually do some decent calculations on, and that's why we now have these things. And now we have, like, you'll hear about half a dozen different algorithms, and people are trying to understand why they work with exactly these kinds of questions, right? Uh, that function is then at the end a sum of many thousands. The, the, the fitted one is the sum of many Gaussians. This one is something I made up, right? Uh, you know, uh, cosine squeezed or something, plus some noise, right? So, I, so and actually, I did, we did this a while ago, right? But an interesting thing is one of the uses of these techniques now is say you don't have enough data. You generate fake data. That's like the data you think you want to look at. And then you train your algorithms on the fake data, and then they work on the real data, right? As long as your fake data isn't too different from the real data, right? So, so uh, there's all these circular kind of things, and there, I think they'll come up throughout the day. Yes, so the. My question I have is that this assumption, you're, you have an ingrained bias that is there. 
Because you're saying that we assume from our prior knowledge. And yes. That prior knowledge may will have bias that you will continue on seeing things that you may miss a lot because of that. And if I were an expert in this field, I might be able to give you a good answer, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm sure these young people that we're going to hear from uh, will, will be able to, to do that. So I'm going to try to get to the so sort of where I wanted to go with some of this, right? Uh, well, uh, da, 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 da. let me see if I can. Do, okay, so uh, well, we'll see. Okay, so 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 this is my first ever movie. Now it's not a very exciting movie, uh, but I'm going to show it to you anyway, right? Uh, it did make a bit of a splash, right? So this is with a collaboration of chemists and computer scientists, right? So this is uh, ma malonaldehyde, uh, and what? So so what we do is uh, let me. I got to pause this. Can I pause it? You can see how good I really am with computers. Um, okay, so this is this is malonaldehyde. And what we're going to see, so what we do is we, we take a DFT calculation and we run it, we actually heat it up more than room temperature because what we want it to do is wiggle around and it explores many different configurations of the nuclei, the di you know, different geometries and things like that. And we, we say double the temperature so it explores this space. We're, we run this DFT calculation, which is too expensive to run for too long, right? But what we do is we then take snapshots of the molecule at different, you know, contortions, uh, and we learn the density functional. We, we do exactly that Colonel Ridge trick to learn the density functional for those distortions. And we do about a thousand of these, and then the machine has learned what the density functional uh, is that avoids solving Walter's equations. So then when you run the machine thing, it runs like at least thousands of times faster. In fact, so fast we, can, you know, we don't even measure it. Uh, it runs much, much faster than solving the equations of quantum mechanics. So what has happened is, even though the, these, it's a really hard quantum many-body problem, right? We know that the whole thing is represented just by a few electrons and a few different atoms, right? That's very simple. So what we're learning is the pattern in the solution to those equations. We're not solving the equations anymore. There's an underlying pattern, uh, which we're not good enough to see, but the machine learning thing does see. So anyway, so we do that. And then we actually figure out the forces on these things, and we can run a molecular dynamic simulation. But the amazing thing was that when we did that for the first time, uh, so, so, so see the, the hydrogen atom between the two oxygens, right, is going to do something very dramatic. It jumps from one to the other. So it's a proton transfer from one to the other. But the reason that's a, so very exciting is it wasn't in the test set. In the ones that we did, there was no proton transfer. So then, having trained the thing without that, we then see it, which it does happen in nature, uh, in the simulation. Now, this is like a little, little molecule, and you know, nobody, nobody cares, right? But it's a proof of principle that you can learn the stuff in one case and then extrapolate. Now, it turns out, in fact, there's a little quantum tunneling that goes on, so that isn't quite accurate, but uh, okay. Uh, that's for the experts to argue about. One last quick thing is uh, facial recognition, right? So I had this very good student, Lee Lee, a physics student, and I was trying to explain what something called principal component analysis is. So we decided to test it on facial recognition. And yes, that is my face, right? Uh, so I had to, I did it one night because I was giving the talk the next day. And at the conference on my Mac, I took 16 pictures, right? And in fact, there's a little technical thing where the average position of my head has to be exactly the same in every photo. So that's 
part of the grimacing, right? Okay, so then you, uh, he processes it overnight and then comes back to me the next morning, right? So this is my mean face. Uh, <laughs> right? uh, uh, if I'm in a really bad mood going down the corridor, this is what I look like. No. So this is the average of all these images, right? Uh, so then we do what's called a principal component analysis. You ask in what direction is the data most changing? And when you include the, the direction which is most changing uh, and add how much there is in this particular picture, it gets a little bit better. And then when we add seven of these components, you get this, which was this picture here, which isn't quite the same, uh, but I'm still, why did he pick that one? Anyway, uh, the point is you, you only need seven coefficients, seven numbers to produce this thing here, right? And think of the amount of data that's in these 16 images, right? And so, so he was working on this problem of strong correlation. Uh, and he was a really excellent student. And now he works at Google uh, Accelerated Science. Uh, and what he did was he applied that principle to the atoms in a molecule. Chemists have very clever ways of taking the density of a molecule and, and writing it as a sum of the atoms. So he did principal component analysis that they use for facial recognition to recognize the densities of the atoms in the molecule. And it turned out to be the key thing that made it possible to do the calculation. OK, we'll skip that. OK, the very last thing, almost, is uh, so I'm, this is a paper I'm very proud of from about 20 years ago. Uh, so this physical review letters is uh, the leading physics journal in the world, pretty much, right? Uh, and I was working on some time-dependent version of the thing at the time. I was a young assistant professor at Rutgers Camden in New Jersey. Anybody know where Camden is? Good, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you, you know, it's a bit of a, certainly 20 years ago, it was a bit of a tough area, right? Uh, uh, so this guy here, Paul Hessler, right? Uh, so this is, yeah, this is the top journal in physics in the world. Uh, this was the group at the time. Uh, and this is Paul here. Uh, let's see. Yes, this is the best photo I could uh, find of him. Uh, so he was a high school teacher in Woodrow Wilson High. And Woodrow Wilson High, I bet, is a tougher school maybe than any of you guys uh, teach in, right? One third of the annual operating budget of the school vanished every year. This is Jersey, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I once went, walked over to the school to give a presentation to the high school kids, and every third house was boarded up by the DEA, right? Uh, it was a very rough neighborhood. Uh, uh, anyway, so Paul was a high school teacher. He had been a programmer, and he'd given up a very, and he was a very good one, and he gave up his high paying job in order to teach in the inner city, right? And he got what he asked for. Uh, uh, and it, it was uh, the stuff that would go on would just break your heart as to, uh, with some of these kids. Uh, so anyway, well, there was, this pro there was this program run by the American Chemical Society where you could take a high school teacher and you do some research for the summer. And so I took on Paul, and he was really, I mean, just fantastic. And we were able to publish this FizzRev letter from the research that he did. Uh, now, later, uh, the grant came up for renewal, and I sent in a renewal request uh, and the, from the Research Corporation. And this letter is a very famous letter that uh, uh, came back. Uh, and so, in which the, head, the president of the Research Corporation has personally written this letter in response. The two of you break all the rules, right? Paul was supposed to be a chemistry teacher, and he wasn't, right? Uh, and he actually got a degree in physics afterwards. Uh, so we weren't, he wasn't supposed to be a, uh, he was a math teacher at the time. We're, they're, we're supposed to uh, do re real chemical stuff, right? That was written into the grant. We didn't do that. So, so, uh, so anyway, the bottom line of this letter is because you've done all this, right? 
we are now extending your funding for another three years uh, 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 because they liked it so much. But, uh, but the reason I realize that this is important is because from that FizRev letter as an assistant professor in Camden, that impressed a lot of people. I then got a job at the main Rutgers Cam uh, Camden campus, and things went very, uh, main campus in New Brunswick. And then a few years later, things were going very well still, and I got my job at UC Irvine. And one of the crucial things was the work that he and I did uh, that summer. Uh, he was great. Uh, so it, machine learning is this huge thing. Uh, you're just beginning to see how it benefits theoretical physics, and we're going to hopefully see also things going the other way. One thing I want to really emphasize, it's extremely democratic. If a kid has access to the web and maybe has a netbook or any, you know, something for a few hundred bucks, they can start doing this. I would say one of the most valuable things you are like to be able to do with your kids is just try to get them into doing this kind of stuff. Doesn't matter if, if you code or not, but just point them in that direction. I mean, the world is changing very rapidly because of this stuff. And kids who can do this stuff, uh, you know, they meet, you know, they get jobs. They, they're, they're just endless uh, use for these skills at the moment, and that's going to continue for uh, quite a long time. It isn't like the dot-com stuff. This is much, much bigger. Uh, but it gives. So no matter what their background is, right? Uh, uh, so you can help create a more egalitarian world, right? Because no matter what the what the difficulties are that kids are faced with, this will give them a skill that will be utterly, uh, can utterly transform their lives. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on that extremely democratic, just need access to web and a notebook? Um, yes. Uh, what do you mean? Yes. That, uh, and how, as a teacher, I can bring that to my classroom, that notion to my classroom? So yes, I can I can I can I can, uh, I can give you an example. Uh, the environment I grew up in, nobody I knew went to college, right? We weren't poor, but it was just not a thing that we did, right? I didn't know anybody. Went. The only people we knew who went to college were the doctor and the dentist, right? That was it, and and we just didn't go to college, right? Uh, that wasn't a thing, right? But where I was, there was, we had a public library. And my parents were pretty big on us reading, right? And I found, but there, but there was no interest in science or anything like that. And I found this very slim shelf of books. And it had a few old books, right? One was on coding. And I taught myself to code in binary, uh, an assembler, right? Uh, shifting registers and things. There was one on linear algebra. I learned linear algebra. And of course, the main ones, I, there was uh, some special relativity with Einstein. And actually, there was Oppenheimer. There was a bunch. Of, so it was like half a dozen books, right? But because of those books, right, when the time came, and everybody thought I was useless, so they decided it would be OK if they just parked me in college for a little while. I went to engineering school because that's what you did if you went to college from my background. And then sort of I said, is it okay if I sort of switch a little bit? And nobody sort of noticed and, uh, and that was okay. But the point is that because of that public library, right, because of that access, I basically taught myself this stuff. I'm tempted to use another example from the back of the room. Stand up at the back, mister, at the back of the room. So tell us who you are. <laughs> uh, I'm Dara. I'm his son. <laughs> I'm a sophomore here as well. <laughs> but tell us how you started coding. So when I was, I think maybe like nine or ten, um, I got, he gave me a netbook. It was my first computer at the time. And I was really interested. I played a lot of video games. Um, and I really wanted to learn how to make games. So I downloaded some software from the internet that was available for free. Um, I read some tutorials online, and I started learning to, to just do a little bit of coding. And it wasn't much, because I was only like 9 or 10 at the time. But 
I got really interested in it, and like I kept doing it in high school. I did some research then at UCI, um, and now I'm doing. I'm a computer science major here at UCSB. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, like it was really important. I think to be able to start that young, and it was really cool that, you know, in today's world, you can now do that. You don't even need to go to the library because it's all out there on the internet. So. Well, it's okay to go to the library. <laughs> 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 And now, he hasn't come from a deprived background, right? But he went to a high school of the arts. They didn't have computer science. And he couldn't take the, I gave him uh, the, a, uh, the AP placement exams. I got the book of the exams, and I gave them to him. And he could get four or five on the AP just right out of the box. Right? But they didn't, they didn't have that exam at his school. And where we live, you weren't al you're not allowed to take it in a different school district. They won't allow the students from one school to take it at the other. So he couldn't take his, a so he could do all this computer science stuff, but he couldn't, it was not on his transcript anywhere. But a crew, so then he came here into liberal arts, and it's really hard because the whole thing is very impacted, but he worked like crazy and has got himself into the computer science major. But the point is that you can do it, right? And then, and he's just gotten some internship with Microsoft for the summer, and they give you lots of tests, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, you're really judged on your abilities. You can be from any background at all, right? And it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is or, or anything, right? Because the computer doesn't know that, right? Is this true? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you see, I bring along my own demos, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, let's skip. Uh, so yeah. So these are the things I've already said. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Kiran. <laughs> okay, thanks for a really interesting talk, Kiran. Um, so we have time, a brief amount of time, maybe for one or two questions, and then also Kiran will be around at the break. Yeah. The Bruce. It seems a lot of your work depends on computer power. What would be the implications of quantum computing and limitless computer resources for your field and the rest of society? Uh, so <laughs> uh, we, we don't really know, right? So uh, a lot of work has gone into developing algorithms for the quantum computers, and now you, you, you know, uh, there are machines, I don't know that you can buy one at Radio Shack, right, with up to about 50 qubits, right? But they're what we call noisy qubits, so it's not clear that you can really use them to do any sort of hardcore computing. So, so they're beginning to appear. Uh, people can make them out of various uh, sort of quantum entangled uh, systems, for these str things where the, the entanglement is very strong, a quantum computer seems like a very good way to go. But they're now beginning to say that it could be another 30 years before they have the, what are called error correcting qubits so that you, ha uh, you, know, you can stop, there's noise in these machines. There's this, qu this is called quantum sort of decoherence, which is very hard to control. So even though the first experimental prototypes are appearing, it could be a long time before they come into sort of widespread use. So there's going to be a a, quite a big period of time where they're sort of accessible, but they're not very good. And it could be longer than people would like uh, before they're accessible. Well, you know, one thing, of course, is encryption. Uh, you can break the standard encryptions with a quantum computer, and that's obviously going to have a big effect if they become widely available, right? Okay, time for one more question. So the two machines that played Go against each other, yes. did one learn at a different rate than the other? Uh, so... Uh, so what they what they do is they they took the algorithms from the one that learned by 
Well, it's not, it's not really two machines. It plays against itself, right? Uh, it's what it does. And they, they take that machine and then they play it against the one that was trained on the human games. And it's that machine that wins 100-0. But at that point, they don't even bother playing a human because there's no chance. And, 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 and this thing then generated all these games that, of a kind that no one had ever played, right? Because there was no human input, right? And this is like really kind of freaky when you think about it, right? Because, you know, you'd have all these very advanced games over millennia, I guess, uh, with the game of Go in China and stuff, and all this very subtle human things, right? And then in you know, the blink of an eye, these guys can generate like a hundred alternative universes where the Go game looks different, right? Like what, what actually gets played is different. And then use that against the humans. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if we hear, do we have anything about sort of the downside uh, on today? <laughs> what makes you think they haven't already? I mean, how do you, and how would you tell, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so unfortunately, um, we have to take a break now, yeah. but um, Karan will be there at the break. Yeah. And I also just thought that if you're one of the other speakers for today, can you also quickly kind of stick up your hand so people can see you? Um, just kind of come find you also at the break. So Giacomo, Lauren, and Justin as well. So um, no chance to interact with them as well. Great. Um, thank you, Andrew.